Good afternoon and hello and welcome to the second part of our three part series on shared reading for kindergarten and first grade teachers. Our first webinar focused on general information about shared reading. Today's webinar begins exploring ways to extend instruction through the shared reading approach. Each revisit offers uh, an opportunity for teachers to support emergent and early readers on their journey to independence and meaning making. And I want to go ahead and share my screen so it gets us started on our PowerPoint. So as we think about extending shared reading through these revisits, each of those revisits, as I said, gives us an opportunity to think about the ways that we can support our students as they um, are continuing to make meaning um, and grow in their abilities with text. So I want to revisit just a couple of points from our first session. Um, this is the definition of shared reading that is uh, that was uh, written by Brenda Parks. And in this, she talks about shared reading being a collaborative learning activity. And this um, idea of shared reading emulating and building from children's experiences with bedtime stories. It provides this enjoyable reading experience and introduces students to a variety of authors and illustrators and the ways that these communicators craft meaning, all with that goal of enticing children to want to be readers themselves. As well from our first session is this visual that talks about where shared reading fits in a balanced literacy program. When we think about read aloud and shared reading, guided reading and independent, as well as the um, the writing components um, that, that mirror these reading components, um, all with that goal of creating an opportunity for kids to develop independence and meaning making through developing a classroom that is built around the conditions of learning and on that base of thinking and discussing. Another idea that we shared in the first session was that language is the foundation for reading. Don Holdaway talks to us about children being becoming thoroughly familiar with the syntactic patterns, idioms and tunes of the language. And the reason that we do all of these revisits and share reading is that that joyful repetition of rich literature through the ear and across the tongue supports students to develop patterns of book dialect in their automatic language system. So as we think about all the work that, that we're looking at today, we'll be thinking about how we're supporting kids through these revisits to develop language. The big ideas we'll support to uh, think about with today's session are thinking about all those things that happen after we read the shared reading text for the first time. Um, we'll think specifically about opportunities for learning, um, for developing vocabulary knowledge. We'll look at extending oral language and comprehension through discussion and thinking about how words work. So each one of these um, components or opportunities for revisiting a text, um, we'll see children on video doing those same, um, doing those lessons in the classroom so that we're actually able to see how the kids are going about that work. Um, and then at the end, we'll think a bit more about how we determine appropriate teaching points um, through thinking about our materials as well as thinking about our students. So what happens after we read the shared reading book? In the first session, we saw this visual and we talked about that the first readings of the text are about introducing the book and focusing primarily on meaning. So those first readings are about meaning. Our second readings are about deepening that meaning, an opportunity to come back into the text and think more about vocabulary, think about the language structures, as well as think about maybe text structures, but really deepening our understanding of how it is that students are making meaning within that text. Then when we return to the book, over time, we begin to revisit things such as phonics or phonemic awareness or word study kinds of lessons. We revisit a text independently through audio recordings. Um, we can have lessons that focus specifically on fluency or print concepts, um, as well as extending oral language. Um, in, and that can happen in whole group or small group we begin to think about responses to reading and looking at different types of writing responses and extensions for writing, as well as dramatizing and innovating on the text. So these are all opportunities for revisiting the text to deepen children's understanding. So one of the other things to keep in mind with shared reading is that when we're thinking and talking um, with our students, 
Don Holdaway reminds us that if children could work on literacy tasks most of the time at a level of success, we would have solved the biggest problem of learning to read and write. And so what he's getting at here is that one of the things that we know about learning is that when children are successful at learning, one of the things that they are able to see are the ways that they go about doing that, and then they're able to extend and build on that success. So that's what we want to think about as we're, as we're revisiting our texts um, in shared reading. So what are some of the opportunities for learning that the books offer, so, or texts offer? So the first thing we're going to look at is developing vocabulary knowledge. So what you're going to see now is a, a, an experience with a group of students, some first graders, and those students are um, uh, students from at Kimbrough Elementary School here in San Diego Unified School District. This is a second reading of the book, you know, and a returning to the book to, to, to explore particular vocabulary, as well as to deepen the meaning of the text. You'll notice that the kids do a lot of that deepening without really any input from me in this particular piece. Um, Kimbrough Elementary School, is, um, as I said, is a San Diego Unified School District. Many of the students in this classroom are learning English as a second language. And Kimbrough is a uh, school that's designated 100% free and reduced lunch. And so when you look at these students, these are students who are doing a lot of really great thinking work around this text and really extending the opportunities. The lesson that we're seeing is the third day that the students had experienced um, with, this, uh, with this particular book. The text we're looking at is called A Pizza for Bear. And in this wonderful little story, Nancy O'Connor helps us see a bear and he begins his journey of eating um, in the woods where he's eating honey and berries and then uh, begins to smell pizza through the trees. And what he begins to notice then is that um, he, think he decides that pizza would be the very best um, uh, food for him. And so one of the things when we were coming back into our book um, to study more vocabulary, one of the things that I relied on was the um, research that's done by Dr. Isabel Beck. Um, and um, she outlines this work in a book called Bringing Words to Life. And in this book, Dr. Beck um, talks about different tiers of words, tier one, two, and three. Tier ones are those common everyday words. Words like eat would be a common everyday word. Um, but a tier two is a more sophisticated version, although I chuckle now, I'm thinking slurp's not exactly sophisticated, but in terms of vocabulary, it would be considered a, a more sophisticated version of a tier one word. Those are words also that you're going to begin to see in other types of texts, um, not just in this particular book, you see it across genres. Um, one of the examples, um, another example of a tier two word, uh, tier one is baby, but a tier two word would be infant. And we would see those words in a variety of different text types. We could see the word infant in, an, in, in a report on infant mortality rates, as well as in um, a non-historical uh, fiction text where it's discussing how mothers would swaddle their infants as they would um, do their daily chores. So you can see these words in lots of different contexts. Um, and then tier three words, Dr. Um, Beck calls, those are, those, the con those are the content words, words like isotopes or photosynthesis. You're only going to run across those words when you're um, reading in, on a particular topic. So Dr. Beck talks about that studying tier two words is a way for us to increase children's reading vocabulary as well as their writing vocabulary. So when I went back into this book and began to look for tier two words, slurps was one of those words that I chose. Um, another word that I chose comes from this page where the ranger comes in and notices the bear who's eating pizza and says the ranger gasps, it's very rare to see a pizza loving bear. And so the word that I chose from here was the word gasp. And what we'll do is notice our children as they're interacting. So think about what this revisit to a text to extend meaning looks like, sounds like, and feels like for the students as well as for the teacher. After the video, we'll talk about some of the points that um, uh, we notice in the, in the tech, in the, uh, it's happening in the lesson with the students. So let's go back to some of the places where Nancy O'Connor's used some really, really cool bear. words for us. Remember right here? She says, bear slurps honey. Now, she could have just said, bear eats honey. But slurps tells us how he ate the honey. Slurps means when you eat it really quickly and you go lapping it up. Can you, can you slurp honey the way bear would slurp honey? Bear slurps honey. Mm, yeah. 
And when you slurp, you're not very nice and neat. Sometimes it falls out of your mouth and it's all over your face. So slurping's not a nice, neat way to eat. It's a messy way to eat. But he's eating really quickly because of those bears, uh, because of those bees that are flying around the bear. What you thinking, Dylan? Looking. Then, and like then. Oh, stand right over there so they can see what you're pointing. Here, you point with my pointer. Show them what you're seeing. I like the bear brave. It was up there, and then the bees were right here. Did you notice the beehive Why here? Why couldn't he get it? Why couldn't he not get um the honey first and then the bees? I don't know. What do you think? Um, I think because he likes very smart. What do you and think, what, Andres? Because uh, um the bees were um. Um, get him and then like and then he won't have a chance to get the berries oh. no cause maybe the bees chase him really far uh -huh. and then he loses the berries Oh, so you're thinking he made a choice to eat berries first so that he doesn't <laughs> miss his chance to eat and let's see another part of our story crunch, crunch. right here when the ranger gasps it's very rare to see a pizza loving bear Gasp means when you breathe in really suddenly, when you're surprised or when you're excited. Could even be when you're shocked, like when you didn't expect something. So let me tell you about a time when I gasped. Are you ready? I was looking at a book, and when I opened the book, I saw a picture of some animals that had died, and it made me gasp. It made me gasp because I was so surprised and shocked. And I said, oh. oh. So think of a time when you have been surprised or shocked. Think it in your head. When, when you're shocked, that means it surprised you and it really just, you were just amazed that it happened. You're like, oh. and you gasp. That is a sound. That's a gasp. Like that. When we what make that sound? Animals? Now, here's what I want you to think about. When you talk to your partners, say, I gasped when, when I... and tell your story to your partner. So turn and talk to your partner. Angelique, can you talk about what you shared with your partner? I think that's that Use our word gasped. Oh, I gasped when it was Christmas. My mom bought me a new tablet. Oh, and you opened the present and you went, oh, so you were surprised and you gasped when you were surprised. Oh, Nicholas, can you tell us about a time when you gasped like the ranger here? She gasps when she sees I gasped pizza? when I saw a dead bunny and a butterfly in a book. In our book and what it does as well as it helps us so let's go and let's think a little bit about some of the observations in the video. Now again, if I were with you live, I would pause and have you turn and talk to your partners and think about what were some of the observations that you made. But since we're on a webinar, we can't do that. So here we go. One of the things that always strikes me is that the children enjoy rereading the text. Sometimes we forget the joy of just revisiting a known text. You know, certainly we want to introduce kids to new texts, but just that notion of rereading a text and thinking more about the story is something that children um, really engage with. Um, it, we continue to deepen meaning by discussing the character's motivation. Um, one of the things that I'm just always fascinated by is how many times children come up with different ideas for thinking about something. And so when um, our little guy came up and was showing us um, another, there's something that he had noticed about how those, um, the beehive, he chose to eat the berries before he chose to eat the honey. And then the other students pick up on that and begin to really deepen their own understandings by thinking about, you know, why would Bear have eaten the berries before he ate the honey? And so they continue to grow and build on that thinking. Um, another thing is, is how many times the students are able to relate personal connections to the vocabulary that's under study. I'm realizing there's a why I'm missing on my word. Um, they're really thinking about how they connect into um, all of that vocabulary. And I think that's one of the ways that um, supporting them in this way um, through Beck's, uh, through using some of the ideas of how um, Isabel Beck 
supports us to learn new words, really supports kids to, to link their own, their own lives and, and these different vocabulary words together. Um, and one of the things I think that's really powerful is supporting children to use the vocabulary word in a full sentence as they share their thinking. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, one of the things that my role as a teacher is, is to really make sure that I'm supporting kids to reread the book, to support their meanings, to continue to expand. Um, one of the things that I have to do is to go in and determine tier two vocabulary to study, um, because one of the things that's really important is that students are able to define tier two vocabularies with a tier one word. Um, and you'll notice one of the things that was a little bit of, of a trick there was because when I used the word shocked to define when you would use a gasp, the students weren't quite as sure about um, uh, that word. So again, one of the things I think that's always powerful for me is to notice, um, you know, this teacher had done such a nice job of supporting the kids to always step up when they weren't sure about something and ask um, so that they extend their own understanding. Um, I have to model using the vocabulary in the book as I share my own ideas. But one of the things I always try and do is make sure that the students are, are given that opportunity to share their own stories and their own thinking of, that connects to that vocabulary. And then giving them that frame to support them as they're learning to pronounce the word and use it um, grammatically correct in a sentence is another way that I'm going to support them to be able to use that text as they, or excuse me, use that word as they speak as well as um, when they write. And one other thing, and I, I didn't show all the way to the end of this, of this video, but one of the things that's so powerful is helping the students to, um, you know, be able to understand the real purpose of why studying vocabulary is important. So one of the things that I do is begin the study of vocabulary by talking about how, how our author has helped us to know exactly how uh, for example, the bear was eating um, the, um, uh, the honey, um, but then at the end, I come back and talk about why it's really important for the kids to, um, you know, to learn new words and how that helps them as they read and write. Right? So one of the things, too, is, um, you know, when I'm working with students who are English learners, um, I think I would go as deep um, with students, even when students aren't English learners, one of the things you find is that um, they may not have as extended a vocabulary. Um, you know, I sometimes find in schools when I'm working with students that, um, you know, English is their first language, but it may not be as expansive um, and their vocabulary may not be as rich as possible. Um, you know, a lot of times it depends on, um, you know, our vocabulary we know comes from reading. You know, the more books that we've had read to us as children, and, and as we continue on in our lives, the stronger and richer the vocabulary words that we are exposed to. Um, and not just words, but even phrases and expressions and that sort of thing. So I would do that same kind of work even if my students weren't um, English learners. I think it really does um, benefit all kids to really have that kind of study and vocabulary. And it's not long. I mean, we pick two or three words to study um, from every book that we work with. And over time, we've really accumulated quite a number of words that we really explored in depth. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to, you know, send those in. Um, that was, uh, that last little bit was a question that we had about would I go as deep with that, those same vocabulary words with students who weren't English learners, and the answer is yes, I would. So another way that we can extend um, learning for students is to think about um, doing some specific work around oral language as well as comprehension, and again, this can depend on if you're working with English learners or if you're just working with students who need more time to explore. One of the big challenges sometimes when we work in whole group is that we often, you know, we hear from a few kids. Turn in talks really do offer an opportunity for all kids to participate. But even then, sometimes you'll have children that you want to provide additional support around. So one of the things that I'll often do is bring shared reading to small group with a group of students who are um, working to develop either extending oral language or deepening their comprehension. Um, I, this could also be a time when I would work with kids on particular, you know, concepts of print or, you know, anything that I've worked on in whole group. If I have a group of students who need that additional support, I can bring that work down into a small group. Um, the other thing I think that it provides for me as a teacher is some really close um, assessment opportunity 
um, because when I work with the whole group, it's really hard sometimes to get a gauge on everybody in the group, right? So if I can bring them into small group, um, I can really focus on some particular things. So while we often think of, of shared reading as a whole group experience, using it in small group in particular ways can be very powerful. Um, and so I try and think about it just as an opportunity for kids to have more opportunity to talk, um, an opportunity for me to revisit a particular focus that I might have demonstrated and have the kids have opportunity to apply it, but then also um, really take on that lens for assessment um, as well. So we're going to visit a group of five students, Enrique, David, Genesis, Astrid, and Delilah, and watch as they come back into this book called In the Fairy Tale Woods. So this was a book that I began in the whole group and the students we had read and talked and done all of this work for several um, days um, before this occurred. And then I decided that I wanted to bring this into small group with a group of students just to hear more of their own talk and support their language um, even more. So my language development piece was a big uh, uh, focus for this particular work. And we're zooming in on this particular page. And it's the first couple pages in the book. And this book is one of those little I spy kind of books where, you know, we ask children to find particular um, characters or objects in the illustration and then use words to describe where they're locating that. So they use position words to describe um, where those particular animals or those people or those um, um, characters and, and items might, might be. So let's take a look at a group of students, small group, as they're extending um, their oral language work uh, in this small group. So we're going to read and talk some more about this book, okay? Give you a chance to think. Do you remember some of these characters that are in yeah. this story? Yeah. 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 Little Red Riding Hood, the White, the Three Little Piggies, Goldilocks, the Little Red Riding Hood. I really All right, so sit back so I can open the book up. Sit back on your bottom and let's open the book up. In the Fairy Tale Woods. All right. Can you spy with your little eyes? Fairy tale characters passing by. And then this was your part completely. Look in. Here and there. Look up and down and everywhere. There it is. So it tells us, can you find? So think about which character you want to find. Send around. Start us off, Genesis. Can you tell us with words? Brown, brownish and yellow tree. There she is. Snow White. Yeah. Jack. Can you find Snow White, Astrid? Tell Snow us where she is. Snow White is on top of the little hill. Jack. Snow White Sydney. is on Jack. top of the Jack. hill. Sydney. What other words Jack. could we use to talk about where Snow White is? Jack. Goldilocks. What else could you say? Ah. Oh, hold on a minute. Let's talk a little bit more about Snow White. Snow White is standing um, in the yellow, um, yellow line. Hill. Yeah. What else could we say about where Snow White is? Tell us what else we could say, David. Um, Snow White is on the littlest tree on the little mountain. She's on that little hill, that little mountain. And it's what does she do with the tree? The what did you say with the tree? Brownish tree. The brownish tree. Just tell us your whole idea, David. Snow White is on the little tree behind the brownish tree. Yeah. Are you ready, Delilah? Tell us somebody that you would like to look for in the picture. Hey! Which one are you looking for? Um, little Red Riding Hood. Tell us about Little Red Riding Hood. She is up the big hill. <gasps> yep, she's up the big, the big hill. What else can we say about yeah. Little Red Riding Hood? What could you say about Little Red? So let's talk about Little Red, Red Riding Hood for a second. Where is she? What else could we say where she is? Mm -hmm. Little Red Riding Hood. Up in the big hill. She's up on the big hill. Yeah. What else can we say? Yeah. Hmm. What can we say about the grass? Uh, can we add the grass into our thinking? Yeah. Um, little we... Red Riding Hood is on the big giant, the, the big giant mountain with the green grass. You added 
it into the thank you. So that tells us even more specifically where she is. So we'll pause right there with our video. And let's think a little bit about some of the ideas that this video brings up for us as we think about our students. So one of the things is they're just, they're so excited to share their thinking. This is one of those kinds of books that kids can revisit over and over. Um, and they're never really finished thinking about this story. They use the text language. You'll notice that they were using the names of the characters as well as noticing how they were using um, the position words to talk about where the characters were located. Um, oh, and they were also able to reread uh, that portion of the text that repeats all the way through the book. Um, and they use the illustrations to support their meaning making. So they understand from looking at the illustrations and then they're voicing um, their ideas um, through using um, language of the text as well as language of position. One of the things I think that's so powerful is how they're really trying out lots of different kinds of approximated language. And, you know, we notice our students, um, you know, they're wobbly a little bit on some of the um, position words, but they're beginning to, um, and those prepositions, which are always a little uh, challenging in and on, but they're putting their ideas out there and they're approximating um, that language to explain their thinking. And one of the other things I also noticed as I watch this video is how they use the other students' language to support their own language development. They continue to build on each other's ideas um, as they're thinking through and taking language from each other as well. Um, one of the things that I think of as my role as the teacher is to invite them to direct the conversation. Who do they wanna talk about? Where do, you know, who are they interested in having more conversation about? One of the things I think that my role as well is, is, is helping them to kind of stay with an idea until they've um, begun to explore that. But one of the things that I'll do is support their rereading of the text initially, but then I withdraw my voice as they begin to assume more responsibility for reading that text on their own. That's one of the goals of shared reading is that over time, my voice becomes less and their voice um, becomes more um, in the reading. Um, and then one of the things that I have to keep doing is probing the students and saying, you know, what can you, um, what else could you say? How else can we say what it is that we want to think about? And that's going to support them as they develop flexibility with language, being able to say things in a variety of ways. And again, nudging children to add more specifics to their ideas. Um, and I just, I always admire when I watch this David, who has already said a lot. And then when I ask him to put it all into one big idea sentence, and then he has to take that big deep breath before he begins because he knows this is a lot of thinking and a lot of language that he's producing. So he just, you know, just the students I just notice are so engaged in being able to communicate what it is that they think and they really make that huge effort um, as they're going along. So one last way of what's thinking about how um, this book offers us opportunities for learning is to explore how words work. So I start with this um, statement from the Common Core Standards. This comes directly from the standards about the foundational skills. And they say, you know, the foundational skills are not an end in and of themselves. Rather, they're a necessary and important component of an, an effective comprehensive reading program. But the goal is not to just decode the words, not to just apply those foundational skills in and of themselves. It's to support kids as they develop their capacities to comprehend text using a variety of text types and a variety across a range of disciplines. So one of the things is that the foundational skills are not the end point, they, and they're not also not necessarily the starting point. Right, Clay talks to us about them not being a starting point either. They are something that help us to um, figure out messages and figure out meanings and help us to get to that bigger idea of reading. So what we'll see as we watch some kids as they are in a lesson that's exploring how words work is looking in a revisit to the book called Which Pet is Best? Now again, these are students at Kimbrough Elementary and these are some kindergartners. And so let's take a look at the text that they are going to be reading. So Which Pet is Best is the book that they're reading. And just a reminder, this was a book that we showed um, in our first um, webinar, but reminder of what the text looks like. This is an opinion text and the children give their opinion and then they give their reasons. 
for why they believe that an animal is the best pet for them or why they believe an animal is not the best pet for them. So we have a pattern in terms of structure, but not a pattern in terms of language. So fish are the best pets. They're fun to watch and they're very quiet. Next girl says, I don't like fish. They're slimy and slippery and you cannot play with them. I think birds are the best pets. I have a pet bird. She can say hello. Birds are okay as pets, but you cannot hug a bird. Now, this book continues in this way until you get to the last page. And this is what the last page in the text looks like. We all think that our pet is the best, but which pet do you like the best? Do you like best? I've inserted a word there, but which pet do you like best? So in this text, it just builds to how the kids might write um, about their best pet uh, or the best pet for them. So after the students had heard this book multiple times and we had, had lots of conversations around the book, I asked the students to think about which pet they felt was the best pet for them and to write about it. So they were drawing and writing. So this is an example of one student's uh, writing and drawing about the best pet for her. So Larissa said that she thinks that dogs are the best pet. And she says, I like my dog, he is soft. Now, it's easy to look at a text like this from a kindergartner and think of all the things that she needs to work on, you know, punctuation, letter D, all those things. But one of the things that we wanna do, as Don Holdaway said, is build on success. So one of the things that Larissa's doing really well is she's got her opinion and she's given us a reason. So that's one of the things I wanna celebrate. But at this point, when I'm looking at all of their writing, as a teacher, I've got to think about what is it that I can do to build on the success that's there. So at this point, Larissa was one of the first pieces of text that I, first writings that I looked at. And so I thought, hmm, I would love to hear her say more. So I go to the next text and I looked at Juan's and Juan's reads, my fish is the good pet because you can feed the fish. Now, one of the challenges here is that when Juan got to the end of the writing where he said, my fish is the, is the good pet, he wasn't sure where to go next. So I thought, well, I'm gonna put that in the back of my head for another demonstration. But right now I was trying to think about some of the kinds of word study uh, or kinds of lessons around words that might support them. So one of the things that I noticed in Juan's was how he had used the word because, and I thought that would actually be something to support Larissa to use is the word because. And so I noticed, that Juan, and I made a note that Juan had used the E-U-S as his, the way he spelled because. I went on to Devin's piece and um, she said, I think dogs are the best pets because you can play with them and, they're real, and they are soft. And I noticed how she had used C-U-S-S -S to represent because. And then I went to Santiago's writing and he said, my dog is the cutest dog because he is cute. And again, here's the word, cause. And so I started thinking about that one of the other things I notice in the students writing is that they're really strong at spelling as it looks, or excuse me, spelling as it sounds. But one of the things I wanted to take them to was this idea of spelling as it looks. And because so many of the students had used the word because in their writing, um, I thought this would be a good word for us to study um, and to think about. So as you watch this video, where we are working to extend meaning and to think about these, um, these words that the students um, can use in their writing and begin to spell as it looks, as well as notice words for that will become more automatic as they're reading, that's what we were studying. So let me show you what that looks like um, in our classroom. So boys and girls, I have to tell you, I was so excited when I started reading what you had written about your favorite pet or your best pet for you and your reasons why you thought it was the best pet for you. I was very excited when I started reading through those because all of you drew illustrations to help me as a reader and you wrote your thinking and it was just so much fun to read. And one of the things that I noticed 
was that you used a word that's really helpful for when you're explaining your thinking. And the word that a lot of you used was because. I used it. Did you use that, Amelia? How many of you think you used that in your writing or you I were planning to use that in your writing? Okay. That word because is really helpful, isn't it? Because you can tell more about your thinking. You can say, I like dogs because, and then you keep telling your reasons. You can tell more about your thinking. And what was also interesting was that you wrote it in lots of different ways. So let me show you some of the ways that I noticed in your writing. One of the ways that some of you wrote the cause was you just wrote the cause part. Okay? Some of you wrote C U C. Cause. Cause. And you can hear those sounds, can't you? Some of you wrote C U S. Cause. Uh huh. And some people wrote B cause. Uh-huh. And some people wrote because. This way. So there were different ways that people wrote the word because. Because they were listening for sounds. Now let me show you what the word because looks like. Okay? I'm going to write it right here. Okay? That's how you're going to see it when you read it in a book. It looks like this because looks like this when you see it in a book. We were listening for sounds. And one of the things that's really important about this word, this is what you have know sometimes when you when you write a word, there are letters in this in the word that you don't hear. Like here, because do we hear all of those letters in there? No. We just hear the A, we don't really hear the U there. Because do we hear the E at the end? No. No. And what a writer has to do is they first listen for their sounds like you did, and they think about all the things that they have that are working. So look right here. See, there's a C. If you wrote it this way, look, you have the C. You have a U. This word doesn't have a Z in it, but it sounds like a Z, doesn't it? The S is making that Z sound. So look at all these things that you knew that you got right. Here's a C and a U and an S. A C, a U and an S. Here's the B part. Look at this. This writer got the B part. This writer got the B part. And look, they have the C and the U, and they have the C and the S. One of the things that a, reader has to, a writer has to do after they write the word is they have to think, does that look right? Because we have to make sure that it looks like when we've seen that word before. And look at this, because, let's count how many letters because has. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a lot of... That's how many letters in my name. Yeah, that's a longer word, isn't it? So do you think if we write C-U-Z, is it a long enough word? Doesn't look right, does it? See how long this word is? So we have to think, is it a longer word? And you have to get used to thinking, does it look right? You have to ask yourself that. You have to check it and think, does it look right? I think we should put that word on your word wall. What do you think? That way you can check it when you write it? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll put that word on your word wall. All right, so here's what I'm going to have you do. We're going to go back to our seats and we're going to look at our writing again because some of you told me that you weren't finished and you wanted to add more to your writing. So you'll be able to go back. If you wrote the word because one of these ways and you thought about how it sounds, now you can check it and think, how does it look? Does it look right? And you can fix that up in your writing because you can check it and say, does it look right? Okay. And then, if you didn't use the word because and you want to write some more in your writing, you might use it in your writing, and then you can check it and make sure that it looks right. Okay? But we can't draw anymore? Yeah, you can draw some more as well. So, let's think a little bit about some of the observations we can make from, that, from this lesson. So one of the things that's really powerful is that the students are so comfortable writing in this genre. Every student in that class could write an opinion as well as give some reasons for their thinking. 
Another thing is that they were attending to the examples that I was offering. One of the things I think that's so important in a demonstration is if, if you can pull examples from students on writing to show them some of the different ways that students have tried out spelling a particular word. Um, and then one of the things that I love about this, this group of students too, they were really comfortable accepting feedback. You know, they didn't, it wasn't presented to them as they were doing things wrong. It was that look at all these things that you were able to do and that you got right. And then here's something else you can add into that thinking. They really were at ease with revising and editing. I'm gonna show you a couple of students writing after they went back um, to their seats. So they were really at ease with revising and editing their own writing as they went back um, to work. Um, one of the things, again, I am a big believer in using students' writing to help you determine teaching points for word study as well as uh, phonics and phonemic awareness work. Um, and really noting students' attempts in writing and spelling offers us the opportunity to build on things that students are really aware of and things that we can build on, the success that we can build on. Um, one of the things, again, I try to support the students to compare their attempts to the conventional spelling of a word by supporting them to see all the letters and sounds that they're already hearing so that we can begin to think about um, other ways that we can stretch their work. Um, and then explicitly demonstrating spelling strategy, strategies, I think is really important. We tend to get stuck in listening for sounds um, for spelling. And one of the things that we want to do is begin kids moving into noticing how words look as they write as well, so that they're not spelling, you know, in fifth grade, still spelling was W-U-Z. You know, we want to get them to noticing how a word looks as well as how it sounds. Um, these are a couple of the writings after they had gone back. And so you'll see um, Jackie went back and she had written, I like my dog, I likes my dog, um, and then had because he is soft um, and he likes to sleep on my pillow, and went in and added the word because. Now, still had the word B in there, but the C-U-Z was separate. And so this is one of those things where the students were going in and making their attempts on um, doing some editing and revision of, of revision of their own writing. Um, and then here's Emilio who wrote, I like my turtle because it goes slowly. And so here you'll see he has gone in and he has checked his writing and said it didn't look right, so he's fixed it up uh, in that way. So again, one of the things we always are thinking about as teachers is how can we determine appropriate teaching points? So one of the things that we often do is when we get a book, we look into the book and we think, what are all the possibilities? So, you know, I might look in a book like Grandma's Favorite Things and think about that this gives me all kinds of opportunities to approach beginning sounds on this page, uh, especially the consonant P. Um, I might also be thinking about dialogue um, and how to appropriately you know, put, put talk into dialogue. I could be looking at when the, um, the speaker tag of you know, said grandpa and I said is in the middle of their, their text um, or their dialogue as opposed to at the beginning or at the end. All of those are possibilities. But the big question becomes, when do I teach those things? You know, one of the things is just because we know that it's there doesn't mean that we teach it immediately. One of the things that, that makes your teaching points more likely to be something that students can use in their own work is if it is timed for when they are becoming aware of those kinds of things. And I think the most important thing that you can do is look at students' writing. So, you know, when I look at Juan's writing here where he, read, where he wrote, my fish is the good pet because you can feed the fish, one of the things that it makes me wonder is whether or not he has seen demonstrations that show how what you do when you finish on one page mm -hmm. and you've still got more words that you want to add, you've still got more writing to do. How do we often see a teacher who demonstrates on a single piece of paper as opposed to demonstrating on a piece of one piece and then showing them how you continue your writing onto the second page? You know, that's something that Juan is showing us right here that he's not sure what to do next. Um, so that could be something that I could begin to integrate into my demonstrations that would support students who are not necessarily sure about that particular concept of print. He definitely has left to write and knows where to go on the next line when he finishes writing, but once he finishes on a page, he's not quite sure where to go necessarily. Um, and then one of the other things, again, is looking at students writing and thinking, how can I support them to expand their thinking um, as well as expand their writing. And so, you know, Larissa was one of those students who went back to 
her writing and began to reread it and think about things like adding the D for dog, but then adding the word because and adding some more thinking. So I like my dog, he is soft because my dog is best. So one of the things I'm always thinking about is how can I support students to take on what are the things that I'm demonstrating? And one of those things is not thinking just about what I'm going to teach, but when I'm going to teach that. So Don Holdaway, again, coming back to his quote, if children could work on literacy tasks most of the time at a level of success, then we would have solved the biggest problem of learning to read and write. Thank you so much for coming today. If there are other questions, if I'm going to be on for a couple more minutes. So if you have a question that you want to pose, I do want to just uh, end by reminding you about our third webinar that's on December 3rd. We're going to talk a lot about writing in that in that um, webinar, thinking about modeled writing, shared writing, and other types of extension uh, activities that we can do that will support students to apply foundational skills um, and continue to um, dig further into writing. So thank you again for today. And it looks like we have no additional questions. So thank you so much for um, the earlier question um, that we responded to and for attending today. And I'll see you on December 9th. Take care and have a great happy, um, happy holiday.